2J, that was the railway track just behind me where the train just passed. I'm parked over in the corner, there's heaps of parking over here. These were nice big long bays for your caravans and things on the end next door to the church. There's toilet facilities and of course one grand building that's dominating the skyline there is the IGA. <laughs> so I might have to go and stock up on a couple of supplies. Oh and how can I forget one of the other landmarks of 2J? The Christmas 360 store. Obviously it's done all its business and it's having a well-deserved holiday. It's not open again until April, but it's apparently one of the, the largest sort of Christmas stores in the region. And uh, judging by the size of that building, it's uh, pretty big. Anyway, going across the road here, there's a, a beautiful Victoria Hotel. It's nicely uh, presented there. Keep walk, walk, I'll keep walking my way up the street here, going past the, the 2J post office. There's some lovely old buildings around, I tell you. Righty-hoo, we are moving on. Moving on from the information centre, great wealth of information. I'm going to forget everything now by the time I get to this door. I'm heading into the Connors Mill. It's back in 1870. So it says it's built for a former convict Dan O'Connor, who was a prominent businessman and landowner. I hope I said that right. Um, this rare, intact 19th century, three-storied, wow, flour mill tells, our, tells the story of our convict past. The mill was um, important to the establishment of 2J, and since 1975, it has been used as a tourist center and a museum. But it's been faithfully restored, and it's not an operating mill, but it's a working mill if you get what I mean. So i am been told to go up to the third story and work my way down. So I'm at the top of uh, Connors Mill. Obviously put the stuff at the top. So we've got here a, um, a cleaner. It says that it is. This thing here produced seven tons per hour. And um, it's presumed to have handled at least 3 million tons of wheat. So yeah, it's a seed cleaner. It was cleaned in three stages. Passed through an air blower, removal of the chafe and the light rubbish. Um, and then the large grid screen removes straws and sticks and leaves. And then the small grid is a sand tray that uh, removes smaller impurities on the way down. That's where we're going next. On the way down. I say it's beautifully restored. It's nice too. A lot of the um, a lot of the machinery here all has little um, uh, cutaways so that you can see it. So obviously these arrows are where things are all travelling. It's going down here into a germ roller, cleaning it. It's scourers, and brushes, humidifiers. Pretty cool. And here it is, the engine room. All cut away so that you can see it, it's a steam engine. 400 brake horsepower. Well there we have Connors Mill from the outside. It's a pretty nice old building that's been well restored and they say operating and things there. Righty ho, just finished at the information centre, very, very good. And uh, right beside the information centre of course was the Grand old Connors Mill established in 1870. So there it is. And um, you would have heard me pause when I was reading the uh, the plaque that mentioned about Mr. Uh, Dan Connor uh, being uh, ex-convict. And yeah, he was. Um, so uh, when he got pardoned, 
he made something of himself, became a businessman and uh, the rest is history. How good's that? So I've been doing this little, uh, it's called the 2J Convict Depot Walk. So it's from the town of 2J there, across the, uh, the railway tracks, past the courthouse, and up to a, uh, a museum, which I think is the jail. So you've got the, uh, the museum on this side here, and then you've got the uh, Newcastle Jail and Police Stables, which I believe the town was called Newcastle or something prior to, and now being 2J. So I think if we go and pay some money here at the jail, it'll give us uh, freedom to walk around uh, the stables and uh, the jail and the museum. So we'll go and check it out. So we'll go and check it out. <laughs> so we've made it into the jail. This is the nice part of the jail. I think this has got something to do with the, the quarters. Fireplace. Beautifully restored too. So obviously that was all the, the check-in rooms for everybody that had been naughty. And uh, out here was their bedrooms and trust me they're looking rather small oh wicked I saw this before too so so this is inside the jail and um, I don't know what era it was done in things but it's an early form of um, barbed wire it was um, putting bottles into cement along the top of the jail to stop people from jumping over the wall so we've got a well here by the looks of things for um, water purposes. There's a well and of course the old stockades or whatever they called them. Holy mackerel, my brain is just bursting with knowledge. Pretty awesome jail. Um, that was kind of like the courthouse that was telling me all about it. Hey, but these, these rooms that I've been through, there's one in particular see if I can tell you a bit of that story as we, uh, as we go on. There's uh, Moondine Joe, pretty colourful little fella. We'll go in and have a look at his, um, well, a tribute to him. So here he is, Moondine Gallery. This is uh, Joseph Bolitho Johns. Moondine Joe, a pretty colourful history. So here I am in one of the cells in uh, 2J. This one's got a uh, bit of a history here on Joseph Belitho Johns, or Moondike, Moondike Joe, I think they call him. Moondike, Moondine Joe. Uh, Moondine came because one of the hills where he was found was called Moondine. Anyway, just a, a rough go of it, Moon Guy Joe. He was accused of unlawfully branding, uh, t taking an unbranded horse and branding it with his own. Um, so he was thrown in a look up, lock up here at uh, 2J. Um, but he escaped. So he was found um, and um, he was, um, well, so then he was found after he killed a ox. So he, he was convicted, he was found and he was also convicted of um, unlawfully killing an ox. So he was thrown in a bit of convict work. So he and another bloke um, escaped a working party in the camp, um, but they were captured three days later. So 1966, Moondine Joe escapes over the wall at Fremantle Prison. Pretty sure it had that glass on it too. Um, he teams up with three other escaped prisoners from Greenmount and they commit several robberies including Everett's store in 2J. Uh, so <clears throat> he attempts to escape to South Australia but is captured in Bogdan and so I think that was over in um, West Onion Way somewhere I think. Could be wrong. Anyway, 1967, Moondine and Joan escapes from Fremantle Prison again by breaking through the prison walls while crushing rock with a sledgehammer. Here we go. 
says here that um, this was the end of Moondyne Jones' escapes. However, while Joe was imprisoned, he remembered a bet Governor Hampton made before Joe's escape from Fremantle, stating that if Joe uh, escaped his special, specially constructed cell, he will be forgiven. Alrighty. Terrific little bit of space. So the jail, the coolest thing going. That was really awesome. Learned so much in, uh, in there. And call me the. But so what I've learned in a nutshell is that um, over in England and things, when you committed a crime, but some places obviously, you know, they, they say that you were thrown on the on a ship, you weren't welcome in there and you were transported to places here like Australia. Um, so people came in and they were basically given a, a chance to rehabilitate in towns by um, giving their services to um, forgive their sins kind of thing I suppose you know you go out there well, well we, we know you've done wrong um, we're gonna throw you out in some out of out of the way area where you can't really cause too much trouble and um, put you to work so um, you'll be supervised and you'll get some lodging and things like that so they're kind of like um, medium security or something I suppose anyway if you did did good then you got rewarded as far as you yeah, got more benefits and uh, less supervision until you're pretty much kind of like pardoned. Alrighty, just about made my way back to the uh, to the van. If you can see it in the background there, cop a, cop a load of that sign. That's a beauty, been around for a while. Anyway, um, yeah, terrific little walk around that uh, what do they call it? The Convicts Guide or something. Uh, make sure you grab the Convicts Guide. The, the 2J Convicts Depot Walk. Get that because you'll need it to find all those little places if you're walking. It wasn't, it was a little bit disjointed but oh that jail was wicked. Love it. Um, learned a lot from what I would have thought as uh, just a small town. I was like, well how am I going to keep myself busy around here? Plenty to keep you busy. Over in the corner here because I walked around with a big GoPro and then I wasn't too sure whether the battery was any good. I found a link to the wiki camp name where I am. It's called, I've called it Viva Ash, born 26th of January, 1847 and died 1904. So yeah, it looks like a bit of a family plot here, of course, what relates to the, uh, where we're parked up, the land. Now, one of the other challenges that I had was to find a, uh, a tree that had been planted for some Gallipoli, and I think the other one was Belgium, World War I, and over this way I managed to find the tree. There it is. So believe it or not, that tree came off of a cone, not this tree I must say, but a, a genetically a roundabout way. So this tree has been grown from a cone produced on a tree from Bermagui in New South Wales, which was in turn grown from a cone from a lone pine in Gallipoli. The Wilkerson, Wilkerson's uh, won their Gallipoli, 18 years old, 7th of August 1915, 23 year old, 12th October 1917. So there you go, it's in memory of those guys and growing at a pretty good rate. Crooked, but getting there. It's a struggle, but he's found a spot in the light. Good on him. Nice little grounds. So here they are, those little varmints. Probably did the wrong thing, put my keys there. Now I've got to go and try and re retrieve them, but that's the ones. They can creep up on you and give you a good ah, 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 ah. Time to run, time to run. <laughs> ow, ow, ow. Yep, just because I'm, I'm on your turf, dude, I understand. Holy moly. Yes. I was trying to get a photo there. There was one that was carrying a, a pretty large looking berry. <laughs> but yeah, I'll grab my keys back now. Oh, there's one still on it. Oh, hanging on for dear life. Yep, my keys are free. Holy moly, got out of there. Yep. That was a rundown of those little blighters. Yeah. Honestly, one gives you a little nip. I'd hate, I hate a thousand of them to give you a nip. You'd be itching for days too, I bet. But yeah, they're all over the show. That's a very big one. Onwards. Well, hello, hello, everyone. I am in uh, One Downey, and um, 
yeah, I missed a day of uh, recording because, um, yeah, had a microphone problem. But fortunately, I'm still here in One Downey, so I can give you the old rundown on what's going on. Um, great little RV campsite here in One Downey. Hey, top effort to you guys. Um, there's six um, pads here we can park at, nice and level, concrete pads, beautiful and comfortable. There's a uh, toilet uh, dump site over in the corner over here. And then up in the other corner, up the far end there, there's a little um, barbecue and there's uh, water available. And even over in the um, facilities over there, they're open um, while I'm here. And there are toilets over there, so terrific. Um, bit of service here from the township of One Downey. Um, oh, another thing too, I've got a, there's a um, swimming pool you can walk to. Uh, I think it's about five bucks to go into. It's open at the moment. And um, the IGA up the road there, and there's a liquor store there as well. So it's, it's a small town, um, but a great town. And that is proven by the fact that behind me, when I turned up, there's a caravan here. No car. What's going on here? Anyway, spoke to the nice bloke there, uh, Josh, I think it was. He, um, yeah, he's on his adventures. Just started leaving Perth. He only made it up the top of the Perth Hills and his car overheated. Poor bugger. So he managed to limp it into here and um, the folks have uh, taken the uh, vehicle back into Perth and um, yeah, he's sitting here waiting. The nice folks of One Downey heard about his uh, little dilemma. One bloke's loaded generator. He's also um, stopped back and um, with some fuel for it and things as well. Fantastic effort. Um, but there are, there are a family of, I think there's four, and there's a little, little tiny tyke. So uh, it was really, really hot yesterday. So that generator came in really handy to run the aircon on his, um, on his van. Um, and then this morning, a lovely lady's gone and dropped off the washing. All nicely cleaned for them. So, hey, top efforts out to you there, one down here. It's nice uh, people out there that look after um, people that are uh, down on their luck and things. So uh, I uh, invited them around for a, uh, a movie night last night. I said, hey, if you want to come on up and uh, have a change of scenery and come watch a movie with me. I've got the 12-volt uh, the screen there. But uh, sadly with the kids, and um, he had another little emergency, which I helped him out as best I could. Um, so uh, maybe tonight, we'll see how the weather holds up. Okay, let's get back on the track again. One downy. Um, it was a, we're gonna go to the board here. But it's a, uh, a town that was uh, born back in about the 19, uh, no, the 1840s. And there must have been lots and lots of timber around because um, it originally started as, they call it a sleeper town, but that was the railway sleeper side of things. So they were doing that. I think there were some vineyards around the place as well. And, oh, it's also popular for motorbikes. Um, and also um, what comes with the timber, they decided to make a, um, a foundry or a pig iron factory. So they used the timber, I think, obviously to maybe create charcoal, and then the charcoal was burned to melt the um, iron ore, and um, they made pig iron for, I guess, the railway. I do know they made pig iron, it says in uh, Wiki, Wikipedia or something there, it said that they made it for the Chamberlain tractor, which I think is an Aussie icon. Anyway, so yeah, there's the uh, 1942, the government decided to build a charcoal iron steelworks at One Downey. So uh, I think there at a, at a peak, One Downey had a population around 1,300 people. And the, the foundry employed, um, uh, well, there was at least 400 people employed here. Now I think it's wound down a little bit. I think uh, what I read there, it was still going at 2019. I'm going to go for a walk if I can there. I've uh, got a few little chores to do. But we'll have a little um, look and see what's over there in the in the foundry area. It's over in this little area back here somewhere. Well, there you go through the fence. There, I've had, haven't had to go far to see the uh, the old workings in the distance. There, I'll see if I can. Uh, I think we'll just be walking around it anyway. But uh, there's the old girl. So it's confirmed. Yes, I found it. We've got a, uh, a nice uh, little heritage plaque here. Thank you very much for putting that there. So it says here that um, you know, we had the pipeline water, we had timber all the way around the place for the charcoal, we had the railway transport, 
um, and of course local iron deposits. Um, they were um, bringing in iron from Cooley Young Nobby. Um, but yeah, the government uh, opened this plant in April 1948. So uh, using the charcoal for smelting, it was a superior grade ore that they were using as well. So uh, it gained worldwide um, reputation for high quality pig iron. So uh, production trebled back in the 1960s. It was 400 employees, so I was right about that one there, and a population of uh, 1,100 people in um, one downy. And um, yeah, pig iron production ceased in the 1981, uh, but the foundry um, established in 1967 continues to produce castings. Yeah, the, uh, it still produces um, some castings. I think I went past the sign there uh, showing um, uh, some uh, digger buckets and um, as, a, as a bloke told me there, like uh, greater blades. Um, and he also said, which would be interesting when I'm um, I'm going to be around Perth, um, especially Joondalup. He said that um, a lot of the, Joondalup was a fairly uh, recent uh, town that's been created in Perth there. And um, a lot of all the, um, the bollards around the street, um, especially the uh, light fixtures and bits and pieces, um, most of them have all come from um, this place here, he reckons. So, uh, you know, it's, it's not much to look at here. But when you are walking around, you go like, I wonder whether that's from the One Downy Foundry. Excuse me for huffing. It's a good sized hill. <laughs> I don't know whether you can see it through the trees there, but um, I think the sign said it was Comcat Electro or something like that. To me, it looks like a, uh, a graveyard for uh, machinery. Got a little bit of a passion for it. Obviously, uh, over the last few years, I've been working some of the machinery, especially the trucks, obviously. Um, yeah, so uh, sad to see them all sitting out there, but I, I suppose they're still being scavenged for spare parts, or some of them are in some uh, state where they could be resurrected. But uh, certainly a huge collection down there. That's incredible. But uh, yeah, it's a big area, big bit of real estate. They're all dedicated to uh, fixing and uh, sourcing machinery. Anyway, on to go. It's, there's not much of a, a vantage point where you can really see it, just little, little glimpses through the trees. But it's uh, definitely a, a sea of um, construction colour. <laughs> definitely coming up to it now, yeah. Tomcat Electro Specialist in Earth Moving Machinery and Parts and I can definitely vouch for that, so if you're missing a, a who's me what's it for the flang ding machine there's a good chance you might find it here Right movie Right, move out day to day um, Man, did I tell you it's hot? That's why the old van's going there, we've got the, uh, the AC pumping It is warm it is very very warm. It's only uh, just after 10 o'clock in the morning and it's already about 36 degrees, so she's a scorcher. Um, so yeah, fans going, got everything pretty much pulled in, just got to go do a final check out. Um, awesome spot, absolutely loved this little stay, nice little town, relaxing. You think sometimes, oh, little town, you, you, make, you make what you want of it, you can either just, you know, park up, put, put the old awning out, sit outside, listen to music, read a book or something and uh, relax and take it easy. Um, I yeah, did a bit of both but uh, also walked around and uh, had a look to see what the town had to offer. So yeah, you dig a little bit deeper and you find some lovely people, talk to them. You've got some great little walks. There's a nice little walking trail that you sort of can sort of find. Um, there was that cycle trail um, if you want to get the bikes out. Um, this, we're heading into the hills which are really, really popular for uh, cycle trails. Um, Probably one little disappointment, and I have seen them from time to time, but I haven't been quick enough on the camera, is those black and uh, red um, cockatoos or parrots. Um, they have been about, and uh, I'm sorry I couldn't get any video footage, but, um, and not, not the sort of numbers that I saw on my first day, and the damn buddy microphone crapped out on the phone, so I wasn't able to get um, some good footage. Um, but yeah, great little spot, so, and amazing. <laughs> I've only just looked on Wikicamps for my next uh, destination because obviously um, I've done my 48 hours here. I've got to move on, can't go overstaying my welcome. 
and uh, so my next day is only just uh, 10, 15 k's away, she did sizzle. Right, one of my last destinations, we've got one more secret one tomorrow I want to check out, so hopefully I can rattle me dags and uh, get there nicely tomorrow, sort things out. Where am I today? Well, technically speaking, it's still Wendawi. It's, let's say, not far down the road. Loose Foot sal Saloon. Um, camping wise, I was on the other side of the servo, but the lady said, oh, there's a few trucks come on in. Be, be my guest and go and park on the other side. So there's a little mowing section of grass down here, which has been nice. As you can hear, it's a little close to the road, but uh, it should die down. And that's it over there, the Loose Foot Saloon. There we go. Got a drive through, and uh, here's the entrance. Just it's just in behind the uh, servo. Alrighty, this is about it. The final run to to Perth. One last all important destination to go and see before I do uh, sign over the old wagon for a, uh, a service. But um, hey, I've stopped at a little uh, stop. I'll tell you more about the, uh, the Loose Foot Saloon over there and uh, there's a gas station. Um, that's really about it, a golf course out the back here. But um, I wander over and I found the, uh, the Station Master's Cottage. It was way back in about 1852. So uh, yeah, just the, the long and the short of it, um, when they were running the horses, they could only run the horses for around about eight miles before they became exhausted. Um, but this this was one area where um, he would uh, what was his name uh, Jack Wilson um, had this little spot here with station master duties and bits and pieces. It's on the way to the uh, the northern via Baker, Baker's Hill and bits and pieces. So cute little cottage here. Back in the other direction, I stayed at uh, just the other side of the uh, loose foot. Uh, that's the stay on the west side. Apparently, it's a bit quieter over there. There is a parking side here on the uh, east side, but it's on the truck stop area, so apparently you can get a little noisy. But no, I had a great night's sleep last night. It was hot today, overcast. Oh, black parrots, black, black cockatoos. See? black and red cockatoos they do exist <laughs> and how many was in there i think six or seven. One, two, three, four, five, six. um oh, it's a good find on the fly um where was i yeah so yeah the truck stop here so the the pub brilliant go go patronize them um good feed i had a a nice hawaiian um uh, I think it was a Hawaiian uh, snizzy and uh, yeah lovely and uh, nice host there and a uh, nice bunch of, bunch of blokes that will come in and have a chat with you and things are very friendly, very nice. And um, the other thing that was of interest, well down, down the far side on the other side there's an old, um, it was an old Spanish horse um, type accommodation, shows, all that sort of stuff but it's uh, sort of falling into wreck and ruin at the moment. And then behind that was the uh, the golf course, which is uh, still currently in, in good use. Oh, you won't believe it, there's even more. I'm gonna go walkies over there. Holy moly, they're all in the tree. So I'm gonna swap the lens. About that fourth tree along. There you go. Now, let's see how close we can get. Are they? My eyesight's... Oh, look at the headdress on that one. He is not impressed. Now, I'm not too sure whether they're black and red. Are they black and red? Please identify that one for me. There we go. Please follow it. Oh, that's a crow, that one. Great. Right, where was I before I was interrupted by them there birds? Oh yeah, well we're going to settle up anyway. Going to start heading our last little joint west. Pop down to where all the source of water comes from. 
Let's go find it. Hang in there with us, we're not far away. Um, a lot of it's probably uh, handy for spare parts. Damn you, damn you, damn you. Here we go again. Buckets and loaders and graders and I'm pretty sure there's one or two little uh, shovels or something down there as well. Um, like we've seen at the super. 